Hi and welcome back to Motorcycle Tourists. My name is Jesse and this is my honest owner's review of the BMW F750 GS. This is an honest owner's review. This video is neither sponsored, supported or endorsed by anyone. BMW doesn't even know I'm making this video. So it's just an honest owner's review, complete and unadulterated. The short answer to whether or not this is a great bike or not, or whether you should get one is Yes, it is an awesome bike. BMW has ticked all the boxes and done an absolutely fantastic job with this bike. It is an awesome all-rounder. Uh, if you compare it, for instance, to the F850 GS, which is a lot more off-road oriented with larger front wheel, spoked wheel, uh, larger suspension travel and softer front suspension, which is non-adjustable, mind you, this is more road oriented all-rounder than the F850. And we didn't just take this motorcycle for a short little trip to try them out and get some, some cursory impressions. No, we took them on an epic journey through Norway to Cape North and back, totaling around 9,000 kilometers. So we have a fairly good idea of how the bikes handle. So here we are in Norway at what can only be described as a gigantic silver moose statue. It's humongous. Good morning. It is um, um, day six, I think, of our journey through Norway. It is absolutely stupid o'clock in a country where the sun rises in April and sets in September. I have no idea if it ever goes down here. It's very, very early. Oh, look at this this is where we're staying let's look at those mountains huh look at that beauty right over there huh that's what it's all about that's what it's all, all about getting up close and personal with nature in this wild and untamed part of Europe here we go Welcome to Arctic Circle! I mean as in the North Pole, Arctic Ocean. We are here at Cape North. Uh, while the northernmost part, you can go anywhere without an airplane, really. Um, it's pretty far uh, north of the Arctic Circle. And I guess this makes us official Arctic explorers. So there we go. Welcome to Cape North. This is Motorcycle Tourists, and we're exploring the world on two wheels. We made it through some of the worst of the rain and wind and we stopped to have lunch here in Norway and um, I decided to try cod tongue it's actually the tongue on the fish just a tongue, not the fish itself just a tongue I wouldn't recommend it I think it's good I like it. He thinks it's good. Yeah. It's, good. it's slimy, it's like eating snot. I don't like it. Oh, check this out. I can say these guys are complaining about food because they haven't been riding with wet feet for the past hour. Both <laughs> feet. <laughs> uh. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm going to make my old beat up MX boots waterproof. And it's, it's a free mod, actually. Fresh socks, 
plastic bags, and you're good to go. Yep. Why don't you just buy proper Gore-Tex touring boots, like a normal person? Oh, I need MX boots. I need yeah. them in case I need to stand up an entire day somewhere. And the F750 GS could absolutely keep up with the R1200 GS we brought along with us. And it was actually a lot more fun to drive for the most part, though the R1200 GS was more comfortable to drive on the long stretches, especially in the cold and the rain and the wind, the R1200 GS provides more comfort. But the F750 GS surely provided more fun factor. And this motorcycle feels equally at home on a asphalt road as it does on a gravel road or well-packed dirt road but anything more advanced beyond that is not something I'd feel comfortable taking this motorcycle to. Uh, not so much because the motorcycle can't handle it but because I'm not all that experienced and uh, skilled at uh, off-roading that I take just about any motorcycle and do that with. I know there are people who can take a Harley-Davidson custom motorcycle through a muddy path through the forest. I'm just not one of them. And the only problem we had with the F750 GS during that entire trip is a broken brake light. And it was actually not the light itself, but it was actually one of the electronic doohickeys in the, um, in the foot brake uh, relay or some, some other thing that caused the rear light to be constantly on. And this happened after driving on some rather coarse gravel road. Now we went to a, a BMW dealer in Trondheim in Norway to try and have it fixed but they couldn't help us because the bike was so new they had no spare parts and had no training on it but once we got back to our dealer in Sweden it turned out it was the same kind of electronic relay that is used in R1200 GS so it's a simple switch not a huge deal but one thing I should mention though is that our mechanic that we had with us along the trip um, he was not allowed to diagnose and fix a brake light because that would void a warranty, so keep that in mind. Uh, we didn't actually try and fix it on our own so as not to void a warranty, but it felt kind of dumb when we're in the middle of nowhere, 400 kilometers from the nearest uh, dealer and not allowed to even try and fix a brake light on our own. But we may do. We, we drove with it anyway. I probably shouldn't say that out loud, especially not on YouTube, but we... we we managed. Uh, Here is my little brother Ramon driving his dirt bike all over the world. Oh yeah. Oh, he yeah. is one crazy mofo. Tell us, why are you riding a Suzuki DR650 dirt bike when you could be riding a BMW touring bike? You know, short answer is ease of changing brake lights. <laughs> Cheeky bastard. <laughs> In my initial uh, first impressions of this bike, I thought that it was not a lot of changes, no huge change made from the F700 to this one, but that was not entirely accurate. What in fact was happening is that BMW has a very successful recipe for their GS motorcycles, and GS stands for Gelände Straße, or on-road, off-road, or what we normal people call dual sport. And that successful recipe can be found everywhere from, their, from the older F650 GS through their 700, 750, 800, 850 and R1200 GS series. So whenever you sit on one of them, doesn't matter which one, you, it's all going to feel very familiar. Uh, say going from the 650 to the 1200 to the 700 to the 850 there are going to be some certain elements that are going to be familiar to you and that is perhaps what I was identifying when I went from the 700 to the 750 GS is that GS genetics, that DNA that's oozing from the Gelände Straße model series from BMW. When in fact this bike is completely redesigned from the ground up, it shares very little in common with the previous models. Uh, 
The suspension is completely redone. The engine is designed from scratch. The electronics is taken from the R1200 GS and it's a lot wider, it's bulkier and it feels more aggressive both in how it handles, how it feels and how it looks. So it is nothing compared to the F700 GS except for that, that shared genetics, that shared DNA between all GS motorcycles in the BMW lineup. Now every motorcycle is a compromise of sorts. You can't have a fantastic off-road motorcycle which is also fantastic on-road or vice versa. You're going to have to make certain compromises. The F850 for instance has a larger front, front tire which is more suitable for off-road but it is not quite as suitable for on-road. With its larger suspension travel and softer front suspension it is very good at soaking up the, the unevenness in the road when you're driving off-road but that same sponginess is not going to inspire a lot of confidence when you're cornering on asphalt. On the other hand, the 750 GS, which has a much stiffer suspension and smaller front wheel, is still a 19 inch, it's not the 17 inch of your street bike, it's, it's somewhere in between. It's going to inspire a lot more confidence when you drive on asphalt than 850 will. So this is the, the, the more all-rounder, whereas the 850 is definitely more off-road biased. All of those specifications and numbers on papers are only going to tell one side of the story and it's not going to tell you the most important part and that's what does it feel like driving it. On, on. <laughs> oh, this is so awesome! Oh wow! And it actually is a very, very fun bike to drive. It inspires a lot of confidence when you're cornering, even, even on slightly wrinklier and knobblier asphalt. It swallows that up and gives you a very comfortable and confident riding experience. Uh, the comfort saddle that comes on this one is such an improvement compared to the stock saddle on the F700 800 GS models. I actually haven't tried the comfort saddles on those, but I know that the stock saddles for those feels like it's made of the back of light and whatever Sadis designed those probably wasn't involved in designing this one, the comfort seat, because this is actually very, very comfortable. On the F700 GS I had, one of the first things I did was buy an aftermarket saddle, one from Sargent, which was actually very, very good. And it was like night and day, it was a completely different motorcycle. But with the comfort saddle on the F750 GS, I don't feel compelled to change it for an aftermarket saddle. It's actually very, very comfortable. The suspension is uh, competent enough to do uh, pretty coarse gravel roads like these as well as light off-roading though that's pretty much where the limit goes and if you're into off-roading the F850 or a, or a dirt bike is probably going to be more your thing anyway. But the suspension is really good even for a big and heavy guy like me because it soaks up the unevenness in the asphalt and even on, on uh, gravel roads like this and the F700 could just, it just cannot keep up. And the same goes for many other motorcycles in this category. The hinges for uh, fastening the Vario cases are very different on the 750 compared to the 700. It shares the same uh, fastening uh, mechanisms and the same Vario cases as the R1200 GS. You can actually take the boxes off an R1200 GS and stick them right on a 750 GS. So if you do buy a 750 GS, you can actually buy the boxes used on Craigslist or eBay or whatever. You, you use locally in your country to buy stuff uh, second hand. Just make sure they're from a later model so they actually fit. The LED lightings on this motorcycle are absolutely gorgeous. They're very, very bright and they have that kind of intense LED light you expect. And it lights up the road really well, so there's really nothing more to say about it. I did do a separate video on the uh, high-performance sports silencer, so I'm not going to go into detail about that. 
I think the aesthetics of it is probably the biggest selling point. The the sound from the stock exhaust is good, is just so good that uh, it's not a huge improvement getting this uh, sport silence and a lot of people who listen to that review either couldn't hear the difference or thought the stock sounded better. I actually had to double and triple check that the audio files weren't uh, swapped around but in fact they are so similar that it's it's not a big difference. You need to be one of those audio files to, to be able to tell the difference. Average Joe isn't. Uh, and the reduction in weight that this titanium sport silencer offers uh, compared to the stock, stock exhaust isn't huge either. It's a difference between whether or not I've eaten breakfast. So I don't see a huge point in that. The aesthetics on the other hand was well worth it for me. I know a lot of people feel differently, but for me the aesthetics was definitely worth it. So thank you Akraprovich for the beautifully designed exhaust pipe. It's spot on. Another obvious change they've made is uh, move the fuel tank up here. You no longer fuel up on the side as you used on the older models, which had the tank beneath the seat. It's up here, and that shifts the center of gravity. And if you do drive one of the older models and then switch to this one back and forth, you're going to notice that there's a subtle change. The, the, it's a little bit more top heavy, and the center of gravity is moved forward, so you can definitely notice that. Now all of the electronics and gadgets and doohickeys that come with this bike are excellent and they're really good and they improve the comfort and convenience level, especially the keyless ride where you don't have to actually stick the key in the ignition, you just keep it in your pocket, you start it with a button, you drive off and when you leave the bike you simply just push the same button to switch it off and you walk away, which means that you're probably never going to forget your key in the bike. And it's also very convenient when you're stopping, you have your gloves on, and you're going to refuel or something like that, not having to fish up the key or dig around or anything like that, just it works until it doesn't. Now, this one has worked, but I kind of dread the day when we're going around the world and the keylex ignition fails and I'm stuck in the middle of nowhere with no ability to actually turn the engine on. There is a trick, there is a little space underneath the seat where you can put the key on in order to start the bike in case it runs out of battery. But if it gets damaged, you're pretty much screwed. And the same goes for the quick shift or gear assistant or you know, professional gear, whatever doohickey. The BMW changes the name of this feature so many times I just can't keep up. Let's just call it the quick shift. It allows you to shift up and down without using the clutch. It's a very convenient feature, especially when you're uh, leaning the bike in corners and you need to do a quick upshift or downshift, you can do so without using the clutch and it's going to match the revs of the next gear, meaning that if you shift down it's going to rev up the engine to meet the new gear and that's actually uh, making a very smooth transition and that's very, very convenient when you're uh, cornering. Uh, but it's also very exposed and a delicate piece of engineering. A solid thumb from the side, if you drop the bike, is probably going to ruin your bike and leave you stranded. And such, a, such it is with all of these conveniences. They add complexity to something that should be fairly trivial. And it's up to you to decide if you get all of these additional accessories. I'm a convenience kind of guy, so I got them all, pretty much everything in the entire catalog. But if I were to go around the world, would I want to take this bike with all of these doohickeys on? Or would I want something a bit simpler? Honestly, I don't know. I think that the convenience these things add would make a uh, round the world trip a lot more con comfortable, but at the same time a lot more risky. If any of these things break down, that could truly ruin your day. These little plastic flaps on the other hand, they're very good at deflecting the wind and they can pick up some of the gravel that gets thrown off from the road, but they are made out of plastic and no more. I kind of wish that BMW had put a metal bar on the inside like they did on the F700 GS. It feels like a weird thing for BMW to cheap out on, but on the other hand I suspect that's what aftermarket companies like Tua Tegamundi look up for and that's where they come in. So I'm guessing a pair of bark busters on there is one of the things I'm going to put on first. Another thing that I think they could have done better is the placement of the cradle for the BMW Navigator. Uh, I am, don't expect I will be getting that, but it, uh, one of the packages that I bought 
uh, had it included and I wanted that package for all the other things that it included for the price. And this little cradle here is where you stick the GPS navigator, but this is also where you keep your tank bag. So you got to pick either or, because if you put your tank bag here, you're never going to see the navigator. It gets pushed right up along it. Compare that, for instance, to how the R1200 GS solved it. It has this little metal frame above the dash where you stick the navigator on. Granted, it does have a higher windscreen, a higher cockpit, but sticking it here, like BMW did, on the middle of the steering bar, is, is pretty unpractical actually and I don't really know what they were thinking because you can't really have a tank bag and if you're driving long enough to actually need a GPS you're probably gonna want to have a tank bag as well but with this setup you can either have only have one or the other so unless you've been living under a rock for the past summer you will know that BMW has gotten off to a bit of a shaky start with the F750 and F850 GS series ever since the intended launch in March this year 2018 that's been one series of complications after the other first several times the launch date got pushed forward and then followed by a massive recall once it was actually launched and this particular specimen was actually affected by that recall so I had to do without for two months and the third motorcycle we ordered still hasn't arrived and we have no shipping date on it so the question on everybody's mind is is it worth it is it worth the wait is it worth the hassle well that's a question only you can answer I obviously waited for mine and I'm very happy with my purchase now, I'm very, very torn between the F750, 850 and the R1250 GS motorcycles. They are all good motorcycles and whichever you pick, you can't go wrong. But they do have different selling points. The 750 GS, for instance, is very good at driving on roads. It's a naked bike. It handles very well. It's a bit limited when it comes to off-roading compared to the 850, which is equally limited on-road as the 750 is. But the question is, is the difference so big? And are the limitations on the 750, meaning it can't go places where the 850 can, worth the compromise? That is also a very, very big and good question, and I can't really answer it. As my sense of adventure grows and my willingness to go places outside of my comfort zone increases, I may be more and more leaning towards the 850 than the 750. But for now, where the most driving I do are on road with the occasional gravel roads or dirt roads, uh, the 750 fits my riding preferences just fine. But ask me again in a couple of years or five years, the story may change. And the same goes for the R1250 GS. It is a lot more comfortable than the 750 in the terms that it will protect you against the wind, the cold and the rain. It's a semi-fared adventure tourer versus the 750, which is a naked enduro travel bike. Um, I also might, since I am a convenience kind of guy, I'm also leaning towards the 1250 and perhaps that's sort of a final destination. Once I've had my fun with the 750, perhaps it's time to upgrade to the 1250 and drive along in comfort. Or perhaps my sense of adventure will grow in such a way that I will do be doing more and more off-roading, going places where the road network ends and the 850 may, the, may be the bike of choice. For now, however, I'm pretty happy with the 750 GS. Please leave a comment in the section below and tell me how you reason between these three models and which you would pick. And that concludes my honest owner's review of the BMW F750 GS. Please hit the like button if you liked this video. If you didn't like it, please tell us why. Subscribe to the channel for more awesome videos and see you soon.